Okay, before addressing any questions, some of you are crazy with the questions you're sending in. I get very annoyed when people don't take advantage of the resources we offer on this site. So bookmark these two links, and before you send a question in, review the topics in those links. For instance, on Stockhaven's Classroom, the reason I list all the topics is so that you can very easily click on the tag, this is why I'm saying to bookmark this link, and then see, oh, I have a question on options. Let's, let me look up really quick and see if Stockhaven has discussed options lately before I send him a question he's already answered. Okay? So, some of you who you're not seeing your questions on here tonight, it's because they've already been answered. And I do my job to help educate people, so you need to do your job by taking advantage of the education that's already out there on our site. First question. I know this site is concentrated on trading, but due to a certain group killing me, I am now under pattern day trader restrictions. I am considering changing my direction to take a look at long-term investments. How are you approaching these message? methods? Do you read balance sheets and invest? Well. First, I'll answer the question, and then I'll give my thoughts on what this person's thinking about doing. In regards to investing, I can't remember the last time I looked at a balance sheet. I do own, I do have a long-term portfolio that owns stocks that, you know, I, I've been holding for years, and, and very, very many years in some cases. And the way I approach investing is if I like the company. Do I contribute to that company's business model in some way, shape, or form? So for instance, I like Apple's products. I've liked them for a very long time, so I started buying them a very long time ago. I like Lululemon's athletic clothing, so I started buying Lululemon a few years ago. I, liked, I like Under Armour's clothes, so I started buying Under Armour a few years ago. I like Michael Kors uh, watches and, and jeans and whatnot, so I started buying Michael Kors once they IPO'd. The stocks that turn out to be losers for me are stocks like Zipcar that I took a nice loss on, and I've never used Zipcar before in my life. I just thought the idea was cool. Nova Gold. I took a big loss on Nova Gold, and I'm actually still bag-holding some shares, and I've... I mean, I don't know anything about gold. I just figured, oh, I need some exposure to gold. Okay, Google. I use Google every day more than any other product in, the wor uh, in my life, so I own shares in Google. So, you know, investing for me is more about thinking about myself as a person and my, the, the products that make up my everyday life be it shopping or on the computer or on the phone, and then investing in the companies that make those products, as I've pointed out. It's, it's kind of like investing in myself. And the reason I like doing that is because I feel like I have a better familiarity with the stock that way. So Whole Foods is another one I'm, I'm invested in. So that helps me get comfortable because I'm already comfortable with the company's products so it's easier for me to be comfortable with the price it's trading at. For instance, Apple, once it, you know, I've been selling Apple over the last few months from 400 all the way up to 650 because it's like I, I've owned Apple for, for the longest time in my portfolio and it's like I thought Apple was a really, really, really cool company and a cool stock to own at $7 and $15 and $30. I still think it's a cool company at $545, but I don't necessarily think it's a cool stock anymore. Meanwhile, Google's been in the same price range for a few years, 
Okay, so it's kind of established itself. So I'm not only am I comfortable with the price of, uh, not only am I comfortable with Google as as a product and what they offer, but I'm comfortable with the price because I've seen where it's been for the last few years. Okay, now as for changing your strategy simply because you've fallen under pattern day trading, you know I wouldn't recommend moving to long term investments. Just because you're a pattern day trader doesn't mean you can't trade. It just means you have to wait until your money clears. You can still make, you know, three trades a week. If you say you've got $5,000 and you're restricted under pattern day trader, just trade with $2,000 today, okay? Make a day trade today. That money you'll, you'll have to wait for it to clear to be able to trade again. But then trade with $1,000 tomorrow since you saved $3,000. And then on Friday, you'll still have $2,000 left over. And then by the time Monday comes around, the $2,000 you traded with today will have cleared by now. If you are restricted, if you're, pattern, if you're a pattern day trader and your broker is telling you you can't trade, Tell them to go screw themselves and go open a new account somewhere else because the only broker that I believe does that is Zecco that actually fully restricts you from trading completely. Okay, this video, uh, this question is in regards to playing the bounce on a stock and they note that they have watched this video on how to play the bounce and they tried to play it on LUXR a couple days ago and they put their order in above the ask and they didn't get filled and they're just wondering if I have any advice for them and unfortunately you know that that just kinda happens sometimes um, you know a lot of this is is just gonna be come with experience where you're going to know when it's about to bounce and you know you'll be able to put your order in quicker versus waiting that split second longer for the bid to stack to four market makers instead of the three where if you would have put your order in when there was only two or three market makers stacking on the bid versus waiting for four or five now you will get filled so you know this is normal sometimes you won't get filled but depending on how hard you believe it will bounce based on the chart, it's okay to put your order in at, at 234 instead of 229, uh, instead of 230 when the ask is 229, okay? On a stock like GWBU, for instance, if GWBU were to tank tomorrow and fill this gap down to 109 and the ask was 109 and you felt it was about to start bouncing, Heck, with it falling 50 cents, that'd be, you know, almost a 30% drop. So you could put your order in four or five, six cents above the ask, and that'd be a better way to get filled. On something like LUXR, though, from the looks of it, you know, the chart, it didn't really tank that much. So the bounce didn't look that great to me. So I think this person did the right thing because the risk reward in, insofar as how hard is it going to bounce wasn't that great for you to chase. Remember, it's, I don't chase personally, but that doesn't mean you can't chase. I've told the story before about my one buddy who all he does is chase. And he makes so much money because it's his strategy, he's perfected it, he knows when to chase, he knows when not to chase. I know when to chase and sometimes I still don't just because it's not in my nature, all right? But that doesn't mean you have to be that way. The thing we love about trading is what? It can be unique to who you are as a person. So you shouldn't let my strategy become your strategy. The best way to have consistent success as a trader is to build your own characteristics and be your own type of trader, okay? It's like star athletes who, who play on the same team as other star athletes. Everybody's good at what they do, okay? But you need to focus on what you're good at and you need to avoid some of the pressure that comes along with being in a chat room full of 300 people where you see them all doing certain things. You need to avoid that pressure and do what works for you. Okay, this question 
is one of those really open-ended questions and one of those questions that annoyed me a little bit because we have so much research pertaining to this. What criteria do you use to have a stock on your watch list? What main alerts do you use during market hours and how do you know if they're legitimate breakouts? Okay, before I give my own two cents, the main thing will be volume and price, just like Big Fish said. And videos that are good for that are in our Trading University videos section. We discussed how to formulate, one of the ways to formulate a watch list in class on April 10th. Although I believe that date is wrong. I think it was May 10th that we actually, oh no, I guess it was April 10th. Oh, that's not the right one. I'm sorry. That's not the right uh, link for formulating a watch list. But I will find it in two seconds because I'm going to go down to our search bar and type in formulating a watch list. And I'm going to go to Stockhaven's Classroom for May 9th. Isn't this cool? And then I'm going to see in the topics it says, oh, formulating a watch list. I bet that has to do with how you create a watch list. And then I'm going to give this link to all of you. And I'm never going to answer this question again in my life. Um, but no, in all seriousness, though, so for me, you know, my watches all come from my scanner as far as penny stocks. And as far as big board trading, you guys in the big board room know, now this is my layout for class, not my layout for regular trading. You guys know that I typically have, you know, 10 to 20 level twos up of the same stocks every day for the most part. Apple, Priceline, Chipotle, Salesforce, JP Morgan, Sears, Gold, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, all right, guys, check this out. Real live kick. Right there. All right, so I, um, you know, I like watching the same stocks. And in prior videos, if you watch them, you know that the reason I like watching the same stocks is because you get to know them and you, you know, stocks are like your friends. The more you know your friends, the more you know what they like and what they don't like. And so that just helps me in trading and recognizing certain patterns in stocks. Watching is, is going to help you. Watching the same thing day after day goes a long way. Okay. And then a couple uh, videos as far as how do you know if they're legitimate breakouts and, you know, just overall how to trade videos. There's that one, which is a must-know strategy, in my opinion. It works very, very well. Um, if you've used the strategy that I outline in that video, just for an example, if you've been using it on GWBU, you've been in the stock, you were in the stock from $0.40 cents up to $0.73, cents, and then you've been in from $0.73 cents all the way up to $160. So almost two separate 100% gains from that video. And then this video is very important. It goes over how to identify support and resistance. Extremely helpful in my opinion. Very basic. And then as for where do I get majority of my penny stock alerts, every last one of them comes from this right here, my scanner. It's how I found GWBU, which was great, and it's also how I found RARS, which was bad, and it's also how I found ORYN, which was good, and, you know, how I found STVF and LUXR. So the key is for the good to outweigh the bad, which is the goal. Okay, and that's what I've been able to accomplish uh, throughout my career, so to say. And here's a good question. As far, it's not so much of a comment, but I, I know what the question is here. So this person just kind of confused on how penny stocks move. IZEA, for instance, had great news, but it's down for the day. SUNV just keeps moving higher. And then, of course, we have GWBU. 
So SUNV, you know, like you said, nice uptrend. IZEA, you know, huge move down. I don't know what the news was, but he says it was great news. Well, news is only good if, if the price is rising. If, if, you know, there's only one person that, the, that can determine if the news was good or bad, and that's the market. And that's why I don't even pay attention to news. I focus on two things and two things only. You guys know what they are. And this video that I meant to link in, this is a great video that goes over you know technical indicators and why I don't use them and why I only use volume and price. Okay, the more you try and figure out why something is moving because of volume or price or a promotion or any of that crap, the harder it's going to be for you to just trade successfully and drown out all the noise. Okay, some of you who played sports or maybe you're a computer programmer or a, you know, maybe you practice law or you're in mathematics, you know, all of those things. They involve specific skill sets. And I want you to think about something you do. Maybe it's editing film, or maybe it's in real estate, or, you know, just all types of stuff, or a car mechanic or something. I want you to think about something outside of trading that you're good at, okay, that you know you're good at, and think about what goes in to your execution when you're performing whatever the, that task might require. For instance, an athlete who is very good at throwing a football, you know, or playing hockey, if you're one of those athletes, do you think about what you're doing or do you just do it, okay? If you're a computer programmer, do you really think about what the code you're writing or, or are you just in a zone and you're just doing it? Okay, if you're a car mechanic and you're fixing something, do you, do you really think about it? I mean, obviously you think about things at first, but I'm talking more as far as the process of actually doing it. I would argue that most of the times you're just doing things innately, right? You, it's just cause of habit. You're so good at it, you know it, and it's just second nature. You can do it right away, okay? And exactly, like Jerry says, it comes naturally. Okay, so yes, a trading memory, and that's the point I'm getting to. So questions like these about how can you tell or is it a suspicious pump, who gives a damn? It is what it is, and that's whatever you want to believe it to be. That's why, when, that's why I get disappointed when I see you guys in chat sometimes asking who's pumping it or why is it moving, you know, sometimes you waste so much time trying to figure out why and then think about why that you just miss out on what's obvious. The volume is good. The price is increasing. There's a bullish setup here. I can make some money. Let's do this. Okay? So, you know, it's kind of like the, the less questions you ask, the more answers you'll find. Okay? And... Those answers are all going to come from volume and price, in my opinion. That's what I have learned from my experience as a full-time trader, and it's been very, very beneficial to me. And this is a good lead-in for this question that was submitted that I know the person who submitted it knows I didn't want to answer it. Okay, so why does what's happening in Greece pull our markets down so much? If I really don't understand it. Greece sneezes and our markets crash. If, our, if Rhode Island has a budget crisis, Europe is unaffected. So why does Greece have so much weight over us? Well, I don't think it does. That's only if you believe what the talking heads are telling you. Okay, I liken this situation in Greece to sports. When that one play happens in a game, that somebody says, the announcer says, that play cost them the game. 
So all of a sudden we're just gonna discredit every other single play that went on in the entire game? To me in sports, that's the stupidest comment that I always hear. That play cost them the game. No, it didn't. It didn't cost them the game. If it did cost them the game, how come we even played the game? How come we didn't just have that one play? All right. So that's a lot what this, this grease stuff is to me. People need to find a reason. Okay, they need to find a reason why the market's going down. They don't want to just say it's because oil's down. And if it's because oil's down, then they need to find a reason why oil's down. And if it's because the dollar is up, then they need to find a reason why the dollar is up. I don't care what the reasons are. Let other people care about the reasons. You should just care about what the market is doing. Okay? Keep things simple. Is Greece affecting our markets? Or is the fact that the S&P 500 failed to break above its recent highs and then broke below its most recent lows affecting the markets? And since that technical event is affecting the markets, now they have to find a reason for the fact that that technical event happened. Okay? So, you know, I'm not going to spend time on this because I'm not smart enough to know anything about the economics of this. What I'm smart enough is, is to recognize prices, okay? I would consider myself an expert in price analysis. And just since we're looking at the market right now, we might as well just talk about this really quickly. So they're painting an ugly picture in the financial media these days, okay? And I want to point something out. We've gone from 1400 down to 1325 in about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 days. So in 10 days, we've fallen 5%, 5 a little more than 5%. That's certainly uh, uh, nothing to sneeze at. Okay. However, if you look back in late July, the market fell from, in, in 10 days when, a, when the market also failed to make a new high in a similar pattern, over 10 days we went from 1344, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, from 1344 down to 1200. So we fell more than 10%, almost 11%. And if you would have just gone one more day, 11 days, that 10% goes from 10% to 16%. So the point I'm trying to make is that even through all this crazy panic going on and everything, the market has been a slow drift down, a very controlled drift, okay? This is like a fender bender in a parking lot. And this was a 10 car pile up on the highway. So to be honest, I can't tell you the last time I, I read read a, a news report as far as what's going on. Um, I just found out President Obama endorsed gay marriage or something like that. I don't know. CNN was talking about it the other day. Um, so yeah, that's how much I keep up with stuff. And it's, it's done me well, not paying attention to this type of stuff. Last question is in regards to gaps, okay? And it talks about when does a stock need to fill a gap? Does it need to drop into that gap area or is it considered filled if it's just above it? Also, how do you know a stock has a gap to fill? All right, let's take this piece by piece. And as far as when do you know a stock, uh, you know, when a stock needs to fill a gap? Um, does it need to drop into that gap or is it considered filled it if it's just above it? Let's address this first. When a stock needs to fill a gap. 
Um, let me ask you guys, what does a stock need to do? What does it need to do? Just in general. Exactly. Nothing. Nothing. It doesn't need to do anything. All right. So this right here, when a stock needs to fill a gap, it doesn't need to do anything. Nobody can tell a stock what to do. It'll do what it's going to do. Now, if it does start to fill, this part here, does it need to drop into that gap area or is it considered filled if it is just above it? Let's take Amazon, for example. Amazon just recently gapped up. Oops. Okay. Now, there's, there's two ways of judging gaps, and it's really kind of your preference. So Amazon has this gap up from 196 up to 220 or so. Now, it did dip below the base of that gap down to 218.20. Would you guys say that Amazon, what would you say about this in regards to this question? Has this started to fill the gap? Did it fill the gap? Is it considered filled or, or no? What would you guys say on that chart? Yeah, I would agree. I would say no. I would say I would just, I would say Amazon hasn't filled the gap at all. And I would also say moving forward, this is key support for Amazon as a slow. Now, this is where it's kind of just your personal preference. How many of you would say Amazon has an open gap from 196, that was the high on April 26, to that 220-ish range? Would you guys agree? with that statement or would you say that the gap is somewhere else? All right, for those of you saying somewhere else, where why 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 and where would you say somewhere else? Somewhere else. Why would you say somewhere else and where would that somewhere else be? Okay, and why the most recent high? Why near that 209, 210 range? Right, I know it's the high before the gap. Exactly, I like ties answer the best. Prior resistance. We broke above it, we, we screamed above it, so now we want to see it become prior support. So, personally, my personal preference is yes, I, I would put the base of the gap here at 209 because of support and resistance. Prior resistance, I'm going to look for it to become future support. If this high fell, that's when I would possibly look for a complete fill down to this range here. Now, some other things just really quickly to look at, you can see that it's interesting how these gaps come into play. Okay, because just, just as this is a gap to the upside, right, we also had a gap down here. And some of you would have said the gap is from 130, uh, 225 down to 203, right? But, well, actually, no, this isn't a good example. I'm sorry, I got mixed up. Just ignore what I was going to say. However, back to my previous point I was going to make. So we had this downside gap here, right, between the one, uh, the high was at, what, 207-ish, and the low was 225, and then 
it tried to fill that upside gap, but it fell short in the 220 range. And now look where Amazon is dealing with resistance, right at that gap. So it's just interesting how things can come into play. And then again, also if you look at the high from the day it gap down around 207.50, you can see that that was some of the resistance it dealt with more recently at 209 that we're, that we're talking about now, okay? So that's, that's that as far as is it considered filled or not if it just goes below it. And as far as how do you know a stock has a gap to fill, remember, a stock doesn't have to do anything. So I disagree with this question just because it has a fundamental flaw in assuming that we can ever know a stock has to do something. A question I would agree with possibly is, are there ways to determine that a gap might fill versus hold? Okay, you take a stock like Amazon, which has held its gap, and compare it to a stock like Apple, which didn't hold its gap, or LinkedIn, which didn't hold its gap, or Groupon, well, it's, it gapped and then sold off the entire day. Are there any others that just this past week have gapped up that haven't hold, held their gaps that we can think of off the top of our head? Well, we'll just use these three examples because these were all earnings related moves right away. This is a good example. So the day of the gap, it's going to be hard to determine if the stock is going to fill its gap. Okay. You want to look for where does it close that day? Does it close near the high? Does it close near the low, etc. But that second day is going to be your, your key indicator in my opinion. Let's compare Amazon's gap and the second day performance and third and fourth if you want. But again, that's, that's because we have the benefit of hindsight. And in real time, we're not going to have that benefit. So let's compare this second day performance in Amazon to the second day performance after the gap. Oh, this is a great one, too, because it had three gaps. Ah, beautiful. Okay. We have three gaps higher on LinkedIn's chart. The first two did not fill. The, set, the third one did. What do you guys see is the main difference, if anything, about the second day's price action after the initial gap higher? Yes, that's a that's a that's a fair observation. Not what I'm focused on, though. I'm focused on the price aspect in addition to the volume. Because really, there's nothing different between this volume on this second day compared to this volume and this volume. We had red volume, we had green volume, we had red volume. Yes. Prior days low. Giving up gains. Exactly. This second day, it was able to hold on to those gains and for the most part stay above the prior day's low. On this second day, it dipped about 40 cents below the prior day's low, but it, it held, the key is that it held the gains. On this third day, though, it was unable to hold those gains and it went below the prior day's low. You take a stock like Amazon. Let's see if we have any other gaps in Amazon. No, so no real gaps higher recently in Amazon that we can look to for guidance. Okay, but so 
here we go again. What do we notice about Amazon's second day gap performance compared to LinkedIn's most recent gap performance? You guys just said it. Um, you know, it held above the prior day's low and it held on to all those gains. In Amazon's case, it, it drifted higher. All right. Now we have a stock like Apple. Okay. There is, there are a couple, the, Apple is tricky because this is a good one. This is a great one for learning and I'll, I'll be very interested to see uh, who says what. So here we have a gap in Apple and I'll bring up a, a daily chart of the time frame just for reference, I'll give you guys the benefit of hindsight. So, Apple here, where did our gap hire just go? Oops. Okay, perfect. All right, so, what do we got going on here? What do we have? We have this gap here and we have this gap here. Any differences, any, any observations that people have? I like this. I like uptrending versus downtrending. I like so much volume prior to earnings. Okay, any other observations before I chime in with what I notice? All right. I'll give my two cents. So, on this gap higher, number one, it's gapping to new all-time highs. That's the first thing I noticed. That was a gap to new all-time highs. Secondly, that was the highest volume on an up day since... August on that gap higher. Thirdly, Apple was uptrending on its way to that gap. Those are the three main things I noticed. Now, I look at this gap and it isn't a gap up to new highs. It's not a gap up to all-time highs. It actually was a gap up to below resistance at a prior high of 620. It was only the highest volume up day since the last update it had had, which was the 17th. And before that, a ton of days in March. And it came as the stock had just went below its prior lows two times and was downtrending. So even though the second day's candle is very similar to this day's candle, both of them went below the prior day's low, both of them came on lower volume, there's other factors like the most recent history of the chart that suggests that this gap higher is actually significantly different than this gap higher, all of which we've named. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about there? Are there any other questions associated with, with something like that? Because that, that's a tough one on Apple, because when we say we want to look to the chart for prior clues, if you just compare the second day 
to that second day, it's not really flashing any warning signals. But that's why volume and price are so important. Okay, and this is again why I don't pay attention to the news because on this day they were telling you how Apple's going to 700 and all oh, this, you know, unbelievable quarter, blah, 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 blah. Well, guess what? It's given up all those gains and it's, it's actually down over the last two months. Okay. So you don't know if a stock has to fill a gap. But there are ways to determine the, the probability that a gap might fill versus a gap holding. Oh, thank you. It's me. Um, okay. And so they say how they're wondering if they're too concerned about gaps, and the one on GWBU, for instance, is bugging them out, so they're staying away. And... Um, you know, again, this is a personal preference type question, okay? I can't tell you to be concerned with the gap on GWBU unless you're telling me you're concerned with the gap on GWBU. I had a, uh, somebody that I, I mentored uh, call me today, and they are trying to get an internship at a couple trading trading related firms and they've already been offered a job with another firm and they haven't signed a contract but they've they've kind of let it be known to that firm that they are they do plan on taking that job however during this second interview with a completely separate firm that he's also interested in working for him if he's been offered any other job he said no and he told me that he he wanted to know if I thought that was wrong and I what I told him is it's up to you if you think it's wrong if you feel guilty for lying about it and you know you should you should do something about it and he asked me if I thought it was stupid for him to call that firm and tell them he had just lied to them. I told him, look, nobody can tell you what's stupid in regards to that situation because that is dealing with your integrity and what makes you comfortable. And that's something that's completely unique to yourself. Okay? Because he knows what type of person he is. Some people could have responded to him and said, no, that's stupid because you're going to shoot yourself in the foot and you might as well keep all your options open. Other people would say, oh, that's very smart because they're going to see you're really honest and they're going to see how much it bothered you. I didn't tell him either of those things. I told him, do what makes you most comfortable and what you think you should do. What's going to make you sleep better at night? And this is the same type of thing, just on a different scale. If the gap concerns you and you're going to stay out, then stay out. Nobody can tell you if that's right or it's wrong. So this is really just a personal preference. And again, I have some videos here on how to deal with gaps. All right, time for some charts. And again, if any of you guys would like a phone consultation, it's $400 an hour, and you can reach me after class. First one, Google. So nice breakout today. Uh, above this recent trading range, let's extend the chart out a little bit. Uh, we're, let's look at this one. So, Google, you know, here you go. 
right? Here's our channel for the most part, aside from a couple dips below it. Well, we could move it down if you want to be picky. Um, but really, to me, the channel was, was right here, the base of this candle for the most part. So nice breakout. And now it also broke above these recent lows, which you know could have acted as resistance, and they did not today. That doesn't mean they, they still won't. I like today's action. Highest volume on an up day since uh, April 12th, which was the day they reported earnings. Uh, they reported earnings after the close that day, and then the 13th and the next Monday, or there was a holiday, so the 17th, it sold off really hard after the earnings result. Somebody made the point today that they didn't, that if you look at the 14th and 17th or whatever, and this trend here, Google had given up all of its gains. And, you know, they thought that was kind of a bearish sign overall. And I would agree with that. Um, you know, Google has shown that it's given up all of its gains on numerous times. Okay? However, with a stock like Google, you need to zoom out. Why do you need to zoom out? Because it hasn't done crap for two and a half years. And it's just been in the same range. Now, looking at this monthly chart, I noticed something very, very, that I believe is very significant. Do any of you guys, what, what do you guys, if anything at all, notice about this monthly chart on Google? Yeah, I noticed higher lows. Somebody said, yeah, publicist, tighter range. And publicist, what, what, what else about that tighter range, though? Is there anything else about that tighter range that, yeah, not only is it a tighter range, it's a tighter range on the upside, okay? If you look recently, the range used to be from, so since 2009, Google has pretty much, with the exception of, of some dips above and below, it's pretty much been range bound between, you know, this 500 to 630 level. Again, brief moves above 630, brief move below 500. However, now Google, the range most recently, and because we're short-term traders, we're concerned with the most recent range more than anything else, now we've actually broken above our 2000, uh, 2009 highs we broke above our 2010 highs, and earlier this year, we broke above our 2011 highs, and we're on the verge of, of testing them again, okay? So, and like you guys said, we've got the higher lows. So from a longer term perspective, Google has actually become the number one holding in my long term portfolio. I have moved a lot of money out of Apple and into Google because I believe the chart is setting up for a very, very big breakout, breakout to the upside. And if you look, th these higher highs actually started in 2008 when, it, when the high was 602, 2009 the high was 587, 2010 the high was 607, 2011 the high was 642, 2012 the high so far has been 670. And even though it certainly did pull back, and it went below its most recent lows when you compare it to this March low. It stayed above its February lows, and it didn't even come close to its January lows. So again, these are just some simple observations I'm making. Another observation I notice is that Google tends to fill its gaps, both to the upside and to the downside. So with that said, I wouldn't necessarily chase Google here. Rather, what I'd do is I would wait for 
a move back down towards 615 because you have a close to open gap between 611 and, and 615-ish, and you have a high to low gap from 615 to 616. What I mean by close to open gap is that yesterday it closed at 611 uh, Today it opened at 617.96, so that's our, that's our close to open gap. And our high to low gap, what I mean is yesterday's high was 615, today's low was 615.94, so that's our, that's our high to low gap, okay? So I would prefer to wait on maybe a little pullback for Google before getting long, okay? As for this action here, we have a ton of volume that traded on these two days, and those range, that's, that's a, on a, on, a, on a monthly basis, it's never been able, since the market crash in 07, 08, it's never been able to sustain a move by to 630. But the reason I'm so bullish on it is because it's spending more time near 630 and less time away from it. Think simple. So I like Google a lot. Five minute chart, you've got this low here, afternoon lows around 622, and then more immediate term, you have this low at 627. So you've got, you've got a nice uptrend into the close. You can connect those three lows below this 627 low. So watch that. Now, what tipped me off to Google and why I was bullish on Google right, right off the bat today, I think in the big board room people saw me. Uh, I said, guys, it, it, I think it's time to watch Google again. Um, first 15 minutes, you'll notice that we had the highest volume in, a 15, in the first 15 minutes of the opening bell as the stock was rising for the first since this period here, which was what? Back April 19th, okay? So, you know, that was my, that was my cue that something was going on there. VRNI, come on guys, I'm happy with the Google request, I will say that. VRNI, we traded 1 million shares today at 007, so we're not even talking about $10,000, I'm not even going to discuss it until there's more volume. Liquidity is number one. AXCG, good liquidity, but it went from $0.06 cents to $0.16. Cents and then closed at five cents. So what do we know about AXCG moving forward? What do we expect? Yes, bag holders, bag holders, lots of resistance. So AXCG, while the liquidity is good, it's another one of those that I'm not gonna discuss too much time on because all this volume in the morning, I believe it was promoted by somebody not saying you can't make money off promotions. That's pretty much all we make money off of in the penny market. But the promotions we like are the ones that show the ability to sustain the momentum they have. And this one certainly did not show that ability, and it sold off towards the end of the day. So another one I just simply don't like. So we're, we're one for three here. ORYN. Okay, somebody tell me what I like about today. Come back, came back, came back strong. I mean, this is the second time. Okay, so it broke the support we talked about last night at a dollar, but this is the second time we've seen a ridiculous bounce in ORYN, okay? And on huge volume too, relative to what it went down on. It pulled down on low volume and it went up on high volume. So that's great. I mean, that's everything we could ask for. 
Obviously, it messed up the chart a little bit because this just kind of looks ugly, this nasty dip down there. But you can't argue with the fact that when it went down there, there somebody was loading up and they bought it. Not only did they buy it back up, not only did they support it down there, they bought it all the way back up to $1.10 as if to say, like, yo, don't take your eye off me. Like, you better be paying attention to me because I'm up to something. That's kind of how I felt when I was watching this action intraday. So I'm definitely keeping my eye on ORYM. Let's stay above a dolly though. We need to establish that we're gonna stay above a dolly. And if we can do that and then climb back above that 110 range, there's nothing that's gonna keep it from targeting this high here at 133. So ORYN still definitely very much in play for me. And let's break it down into a five minute signal so you know, let's go 15 minutes that'll give us more so we've seen weakness the last two days what do the last two days have in common from looking at this chart weakness the last two days compared to that initial day on monday what do you, what do these two weekdays have in common yes volume what about the volume Right, the volume has been lower at the open. So that right off the bat has signaled to us that you know there just wasn't as much interest as there had been earlier on Monday or last week. All right, so that was our first clue that you know we need to be careful about ORYN the last two days. So tomorrow though, if we see volume of greater than I, I'm gonna say 160,000 shares to 200,000 shares as the price is increasing, I believe you'll start to see a lot of interest on ORYN and I'd expect it to hold support above a dollar. Remember, the key is the price has to be increasing. Uh, TVIX, somebody requested it, not gonna cover it. Uh, the reason is because we discussed a similar uh, chart uh, instrument last night in class at the 3825 mark. So if you want to get my thoughts on TVIX, you'll get my thoughts on it by clicking that link and fast forwarding the 3825. No one sent in GWBU. As you guys know, I only cover what gets sent in. CBIS, again, one of these. It's just not trading any volume for us to really care about it right now. And it's in a downtrend, and it's given up all of its gains from that last bounce. So, you know, it needs to hold this low at $0.07, cents, needs to break above this high at $0.10 cents before it can really get going, and we need volume to increase. So, one to, you know, it's not necessarily one you don't want to watch, but it's just, it's not going to take up any of my level two boxes, that's for sure. I'll, I'll keep it on a watch list, but not my level two. Starbucks, a uh, name that had been an extremely bullish run here recently, but uh, so, some troubling things have gone on in the chart for me. Okay. First one sticks out like a sore thumb. Somebody in, ch in chat should be able to notice it. What do we see here on Starbucks? Looking at a two-year daily chart. Yeah, it broke the trend, but that's more obvious and that, you know, what else do we notice? What I think is the most important thing is somebody, let's see if somebody points it out. Yep. Biggest volume to the downside in a very, very long time. So that was our highest volume on a down day. That was 27 million shares on a down day. That was the highest volume on a down day in at least the last three years. Okay. Now, there's one caveat to all of this that I have to point out, and there's a main difference. Starbucks is a stock that's been a monster. And it suffered the highest volume on a down day that it had in at least three years. Lululemon is a similar stock that's been a monster. 
It also suffered the highest volume on a down day that it had in at least three years on December 11, 2011. Let's compare these high volume down days to each other. So I'll show you the Starbucks one. We'll look at one year charts. I'll show you the Starbucks one. Here's the Lululemon one. What are the, what do we compare and contrast between Starbucks and Lululemon? Because Lululemon, as you see, after its highest volume on a down day, it went up another 100%. Starbucks was at all-time highs, but I mean, Lululemon wasn't at all-time highs, but it wasn't too far away from them. Yes, there's a base, just like we talked about with Google. And Ty, I like what you said, Lulu was on support with high volume, okay? You guys remember we talked about, uh, yeah, Publicist is an A student, look at that. Do you guys remember what we said about Home Depot yesterday? when we compared the highest volume on a down day on Home Depot yesterday compared to the highest volume in August. Do you guys remember what we said about it? Right. It was off of a downtrend and, you know, we suspected that, remember, somebody has to be buying there, okay? So that was off of a downtrend. Lululemon is the same thing. Off of a downtrend, held above support. It was actually all Lululemon was doing on that huge volume down day was the same thing it had been doing for, uh, for what, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight months. And that's channeling, right? We had our points of reference on Lululemon. We just had a wide channel, just like we talked about with Google. Furthermore, what do we notice about this high volume down day? It opened at 41 and it closed at 47. Okay. So we've got all of those things working in favor of Lululemon. And now when we look at Starbucks, we can't say any of those things. We can't say anything we said about Home Depot back in August and we can't say anything we just said about Lululemon or that we've said about Google. None of those can be applied here on Starbucks. So the other thing, Starbucks opened at 58 closed at 57.43. So that's another difference between this high volume down day and Lululemon's high volume down day. Okay, so now Starbucks, here's the downtrend, one of the downtrends anyway, that it's in. And then this is, so overall it's in a downtrend, right? And it's, it's having a day like that after a huge monstrous rally. So we have to be concerned with those people. Secondly, as you guys noted, it broke this uptrend. Didn't break it big time, but it definitely broke it. Um, and it, but again, we need to be on the lookout for something like this. Something like this action right here because it broke the downtrend here, but it was able to get back above it, okay, and start a new downtrend. So what I want to see is, I, is Starbucks going to be able to reclaim this trend right here? Okay. Let's, let's focus on the short term and then, and then go, go to a longer term picture, though. We'll focus on the short term first. In the short term, I've outlaid what I believe to be a, a case for being bearish on Starbucks in the short term. The volume pattern isn't that good at all, as we discussed, and the price 
you know, continues to drift. It just broke below this low, and it's in a downtrend like we talked about. It's going down on high volume, going up on low volume. So this 54 level acted as resistance back here in late March, and then it broke above it, which was, a, which was an all-time high, I believe. Yes, that's correct. So so you can see now, after it broke, that range acted as resistance. So now we want to see, is 54 going to continue to be resistance? As for support, we've got these, this prior high right here. It looks like it's starting to provide some support. That high is at 52.50. So you've got this range here with the high side of 52.50 and then the other highs around 49 or so. Okay, so that could be the target for Starbucks in, in the short to intermediate term. If it can break back above this 54 to 55, 56 range, it's going to have a hard time, in my opinion, reclaiming the range from this candle. Why am I only putting my channel lines around the low and the high of this candle? Yes, greatest volume. And the greatest volume tells us that that's where the most money is. Okay? So we want to trade based on where the money is. So that's why, even if it can break back above that resistance I just talked about, I believe it will have a hard time with this 5650 to 5850 range because there is a ton of money trapped in there. Because remember, anybody who bought on this day who held for five days, they're now at a loss. So if it comes back up to that level, that's their chance to break even if they choose to. Let's look at a longer term view. Just a beast, okay? Broke above its all-time highs last year. Very much in a very, very strong uptrend overall. Okay, not even close to being in danger of, of breaking its longer term uptrend. So if you have a investment horizon of a few years versus a few weeks or a few months, there's nothing to worry about with a stock like Starbucks. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out because it's important that you need to take on different time horizons of charts depending on if you're going to be trading the stock or investing the stock. Now, that's not to say if you're up 100% on Starbucks, you know, you shouldn't just keep holding. If you, if you wanted to take profits at some point, you should do so. You know, you should, whether you're trading or investing, you should still have a plan. The only difference is when you're trading, your plan is going to be revolved around short-term time horizons. When you're investing, your plan is going to be revolved around long-term time horizons. Maybe I bought Starbucks in 2007 for what? Let's see what it was at. Maybe you bought it in 2007 around 25, and you just said, I'm just going to hold Starbucks. And it, you know, it's gone down, and, and you said, I'm going to hold Starbucks. I think this stock can double. Well, guess what? It's doubled. You know? So you should maybe take some profits because in the short term, the trend does look like it will offer you a better entry point. Or if you have a long-term time horizon, there's no reason to buy Starbucks right here. Okay? I would say you want to buy Starbucks maybe closer to 50 for a longer-term perspective. And again, that's where our last consolidation was 46.50 on the high side to 49.30 uh, 49 on, on the low side. So that 46 to 50 range is where I might look to initiate a long-term position. ROSG, Ross G, went nuts today, closed well off the highs, closed below the base of this gap down.
highest volume on an up day in the stock's history, I believe. Overall, though, just a disgusting downtrend. And, you know, you want to watch what this stock does the next day. Into the close, it was downtrending, went below its lows from the afternoon, went below its lows from the late morning, put in fresh lows going into the close. So the bias on my end is bearish heading into tomorrow, personally. Needs to crack back above, you know, this high here, 535, then 560. And then you've got the base of these lows. So you've got this low acted as support. And these lows acted as support. So, you know, this low at 551 is right around this high of 560 or so. And, you know, th these lows around 6 coincide with these highs in that 620 range. So I just see a lot of resistance because, remember, we just like we have bag holders on AXCG, now we've got bag holders on ROSG. However, if we can open higher, say it gaps higher above these resistant levels on greater than 300,000 shares within the first five minutes, now we've got a whole different story and now we can take on a bullish perspective. But if we don't get that volume, it's, you know, there's two things that are going to happen. It's either going to consolidate or it's going to start pulling back even further. The end of day action is suggesting that it's going to pull back. And again, from a long-term perspective, this is a not much that I like about it. Looks like they just did a reverse split, judging by the volume out of nowhere and whatnot. So a lot of dilution today also. How do we know there's a lot of dilution today? Because the volume is coming out of nowhere, so we have to assume it's coming from the company or note holders, which is essentially the same thing. With that said, it did rise 200%. So they, they, they diluted in a manner where they still allowed it to rise a substantial amount. All right. That's it. So tomorrow's last day. Oh, I see, that makes sense. Yeah, D-O-M-K. Yeah, I was wondering... Hope you still found the answer helpful. All right, guys, you're welcome. Have a good night, and last day of class tomorrow.